Come here. And welcome to another episode of 72 Pen Connector. With us today, we have Tom Webster. Actually, here. Yeah, here. Like, yeah, like here. Right again, there. there. Again. Right. There. You're there. Sort of. I might be a Tupac style hologram. You don't know. I could be. That Tupac style hologram would be fucking sick. Yeah. If you could be that, I'd rather have you as a hologram than you. I'd rather have me as a hologram than me. Because that is fucking sick. So uh, the (laughs) podcast is going to kind of look like this now, Uh, probably with more microphones next time, hopefully. Uh, But I now live in this state, which is kind of weird. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. And, uh, you know, we're we're here on the same camera. And also with us today is not a hologram, Adam Jordan. Who has yet to move to this state. Okay, well, yes. (laughs) <laughs> who seems to not be a hologram yet. <laughs> soon. Hello. Very soon. But yes, so um, as you can see, uh, we are switching our dynamic. For those of you listening on audio only, um, Tom is here in person, as he has stated. Uh, we are currently trying to figure out our new podcast situation. Given that Tom and I can be in person, we're going to keep trying to figure out how to set up the house to get semi-studio-ish going on to remove this really roomy sound and as you can see if you're watching the live stream the super shitty lighting that tom and i are currently dealing with (laughs) believe it or not this is actually a bigger problem than it sounds like there's it's a logistical nightmare trying to get all of this stuff figured out and uh, especially with the the mics and making the room less echoey it actually takes some some hardware and some engineering sense to it Physics. Yes, physics. Lots of physics. We've got Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye coming out here next week <laughs> to survey this room to get us the ultimate studio sound. Also, um, we're, we're having Dre come out to do the sound check personally, so we should have that on lock here soon. <laughs> Wait, is it, or is it on if lock only. or is it on fleet? If only. What, what are the I kids saying now? Um, uh, uh, it changes so fast, I don't, I don't know anymore. It's is probably it fam? something new. It, that is so fam. Well, fa- fa- fam is like family, man. Oh, oh, so I can't say that yeah, so fam. fam. No. You don't okay. get it, fam. Damn. Right? Oh, yeah, that, I mean, wow. uh, god damn, wow. we're old and out of fucking touch. We yeah, digress. We <laughs> uh, <laughs> so how, how are you guys doing? Um, going pretty well. My week's uh, been um, really calm. Work's been going good, and I've been playing a shit ton of fucking games once I've been healthy. Nice. My week has, has not been very calm. Uh, my <laughs> week has actually been six different kinds of fresh hell. Uh, everything from moving woes to driving in a strange state with West Coast drivers, which are somehow worse than East Coast drivers and better at the same time. Um, they'll actually signal when they're trying to run you over instead of just trying to run you over. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's been fun, but uh, I have not been playing a lot of games because all of my gaming equipment is in boxes somewhere towards the middle of the United States right now. Yeah, part of the fun of moving. What about you, Adam? Since uh, you're still in the same exact location without any logistical <laughs> change, how is your week? My week's been good. Um, I work in a different place all the time. I could work in, in many different places. It's like a territory of places. And this particular place is three miles down the road nice. so that's been so nice instead of driving an hour to work every morning i'm driving seven minutes five minutes something like that so that's been that's been really really nice actually that's fantastic yeah that's um i used to work at the same spot when it's a far haul it sucks mm. really sucks turns an eight hour day into a 10 hour day Yep, I know how that goes. I used For to drive the same a, amount of money. <laughs> used to drive an hour there and an hour back every day yeah, for three years. That's rough. And then that's you're going to come here and you're going to drive an hour there and an hour back. Yep. Yeah. Every day for the next <laughs> three months. <laughs> or yeah. however long you decide to stay. So, on a game note... Tom, have you played anything this week? Yes, believe it or not. Uh, I have almost finished Metroid Fusion, and I actually forgot that Metroid Fusion will kick your ass six ways to Sunday. Um, It's (laughs) absolutely... Uh, a very difficult Metro game where Super Metroid gave you like all of these power-ups and made you a fucking badass by the end, by the end of the game. In Metroid Fusion, 
uh, the one of the last bosses you face will absolutely wreck your shit if you're not on your A game. It's it's a wonderful feeling, but I died like six times on the plane, and the guy next to me was sort of watching. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to play something else so I don't embarrass myself too badly. Um, yeah, so it, it's almost complete, but not quite yet complete. Uh, other than that, uh, I've been going through A Link to the Past. Um, I went back to the light world after I completed a couple dungeons. Like, holy shit, I forgot to get all of these upgrades because I was basically speedrunning dungeons. Uh, and so now I'm running around doing side quests and stuff like that. But that's about it for me. What about you, Adam? Anything uh, fun or new? Or Okay, so we know you. We know what you've been playing. Anything fun or interesting (laughs) in that? Yes, actually. um, uh, We played some Battlegrounds today, and we won. And I actually did a lot of cool stuff in that match. Really? So so we're, yeah, so we're, we're kind of holed up in this house. And this car pulls up full of people to this house across the street. And uh, somehow they managed to ki- the, to knock down a couple of our teammates or whatever. So I'm, I'm going around. I like go out of the back of our building. I swing way around the back, uh, the hill out of the way. And then I start coming into the back of that house through the garage. So I catch a guy uh, at his back. So I shoot him. I start to go up the stairs. It's one of those buildings where it has those two staircases, you know, it goes up one direction and then it goes back the other direction to the yeah. second set of stairs. And you always got those people that camp the top of the stairs because so, they get that vantage point, you know, if anybody comes up the stairs, they're already facing them, right? So I start to go up the first set of stairs and I turn around and I see the guy up on the ledge and somehow, with my terrible reaction time that I normally have, <laughs> I ended up killing this guy before he could kill me <laughs> in that situation. So... So I got us free of the house, and we we left in their car. Actually, we stole their car, and um, <laughs> we ended up winning. We got to the, the the very last circle in the game was this tiny little house, um, and we ended up getting into this house. Nobody else was in there, and the circle closed in. And there's people surrounding the house everywhere. Oh Jesus! There's probably six people surrounding the house. We ended up picking two off while we were inside the house. The last territory moved. We couldn't stay in the house anymore, otherwise we would have died. So we're all out in this middle of the field in this small circle shooting at each other, and everybody died. I was the last one standing. I find I got the last guy and we won. It was so cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I've still <sighs> yet to win one. So um. were, did you have randos <laughs> on, your, on your team or was it all you know everyone in our Discord no, server? No, it was Yeah, it was everybody on the Discord server. Okay with some friends it was fun it was so it was so stressful at the end <laughs> yeah God, i love that game that, that game is great we've had some uh really really interesting moments um deal as i and you were playing yeah. um earlier today and um we're just rolling up in this jeep and we're like you know there's this house let's uh go check it out and a really technical detail about this is all vehicles spawned facing the east Huh. Yeah. So something you can do is kind of park a vehicle facing east if you get out of it. So I'm taking my time coasting, getting it perfectly east. The doors are shut. It looks good. The loop. And right when we're about to get out, all hell breaks loose. An entire <laughs> squad opens fire on us. Good God. Delias and Adam get killed within a second. <laughs> I four to take was... off. And then I die before I even get like up to 10 miles an hour. It didn't make any sense because it wasn't like one person started firing and then another one started firing and then they all started joining. It was like they counted down to themselves in Discord, like, all right, everybody, three, two, one, and everybody just unloaded all at once. Well, that's what you do in uh, in Ghost Recon is you do those sync shots. You call down to yeah. your teammates, you're like, all right, take them out, three, two, one, and then you all execute the same headshot at the same time. Hmm. Um it's it's cool. wonderfully tactical now like in single player modes when you can control your computer teammates it's way way easier uh but in multiplayer i i, I don't play much ghost recon but it's just yeah. fantastic when that stuff happens nice so other than that um i played like 15 minutes of the binding of isaac which i still need to stream sometime and play play some more um but that a lot of rocket league is normal and that pretty much sums it up for me yeah eric um, it's it's been um the start of the week i've been battling strep throat so at the beginning of the week i didn't play a whole lot yes tom you're safe i've been on biotics for over a week now so i'm <laughs> much much better 
Um, biotics? Antibiotics. Biotics. No, 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 no. Bi- extra biotics. 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 You've been on extra biotics. Extra biotics. Nice. I've been, yeah, I'm <laughs> going to get all decked out here. But um, so about beginning of the week, I wasn't doing a whole lot at all. As it went, I started doing some Isaacs, getting back into that for like the 50th time. I swear to God, I can never pull away from that game. Um, <laughs> but there's a game I've. Back when I was a kid, there was a game called, I shouldn't say a kid, it wasn't that young, uh, called Majesty. It's a kingdom simulator where you're this king and you can sanction the building of buildings. You can sanction guilds to recruit new guild members like Warriors Guild. Tell them, yes, I want another warrior. But that's all you do. You can't control the peasants to make the buildings happen. They have to get there and do that on their own accord. So if you have two different things that are queued to build, you can't control what they go to build. And let's say there's these monsters attacking. You can't attack them. They have, the heroes have to decide to attack them on their own. So there's some things you can do, like you can offer bounties. You could say, hey, I'm going to give you 500 gold to whoever kills this monster. And certain certain hero types are more inclined to go for bounties. And then, like other hero types, like rangers, are more inclined to explore the map. So you have this whole kingdom where you don't control a damn thing over the sanction, other than the sanctioning of buildings and stuff. Well, mm. I loved this game as a kid. I thought it was fantastic. I like sim-based games. It's kind of RTS simmy, so it's a really yeah. cool mix. And then last week, I find out, oh fuck, there was a sequel that came out back in '09 that I had no clue of. So, um, it's a really old game. I went and I downloaded Majesty 2. And I've been playing some of that, and fuck, I still love that game. So it's good. That that sounds fantastic. It is hard as shit. Because you'll get, like, these huge-ass trolls, and they're coming in your tower, just their town destroying you, and you can't get your fuckers to fight them. And this isn't like an RTS where, okay, I'm throwing things at them, and they die, and I just have more coming. Your heroes um, level up. So as you uh, fight, or as they fight, they get levels, they get stronger, they get gold, they come into shops, they buy items from the blacksmith or uh, potions from the merchants. So it's Mm -hmm. an actual living, they play it like an RPG, you're trying to deal with it like an RTS. So when they die, that's substantial because you have to recruit a brand new level one. Oh, so it's a real, real struggle once you have a few high level people die off. Or a few high-level people that refuse to help, like wizards, are really finicky. So they'll mm. leave really quick. As soon as someone looks at them the wrong way, they're the fuck out of there. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely interesting. It's fun. So, so does if, it, hold, uh, it, it holds up to your nostalgia? Um, I believe so, because this game isn't something that requires ungodly graphics. It's right. a lightweight game. If you have a half-ass, not-the-greatest-computer, you can play this still. If you can run TF2, you can play this game. I'm, I'm going to add this to my list because I've got a uh, not-so-great gaming computer right now that, that can run CSGO barely at, uh, at like, 20-ish frames per second. Nice. Uh, and, and Majesty <laughs> 2 sounds right up my alley. So it, it sounds like it's got the Dwarf Fortress thing where you kind of you push the world to go in a certain direction, but it doesn't necessarily have to follow you. It's yeah. really cool. It's it's really fun. Uh there's free plays and then there's also um uh campaign missions, which are really interesting and really, <laughs> really, really fucking hard. Um other than that, um it's been more of the same. Been doing the normal um uh player unknown battleground as we talked about, and been doing some Rocket League, which is weird. I went an entire week without playing Rocket League. And coming back into that, it's a weird feeling because I feel like I was actually playing better now that I've had yeah. that break. Mm-hmm. The, I've heard about that in competitive games and not just Rocket League, but you know, all competitive games. It's when you get into that slump and you start playing on like autopilot, basically. So you yeah. take this break and it like resets your, your I don't want to say muscle memory, but it resets like your, your you know, you don't go into autopilot as much. You, you start and giving a shit. Your, yeah, and you're focusing more about what you're doing consciously. Your fast twitch muscles that were all reflex are now not as much reflex and you have to retrain. 
with uh, with Dota, yeah. I did that for a while. I was I was playing Dota, you know, all day for at least a couple hours a day, uh, and it just it was a drag, and I was losing most of my game. So I, I stopped playing for a couple of weeks, came back, and you know started winning. And I would only play a game, maybe two games at a time, and then take a day or two in between them. And I enjoyed those games far far more than I did when I was playing, you know, five games a day. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty ridiculous for, you know, online competitive gaming, five hours a day. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll never get to that, but I'm not going to lie. Um, I heard a term I really kind of liked is there's two different types of games. You have games like while well, talking Majesty and stuff like that, which are just fun games you play. And then you have games that become a way of life games. Yeah. Like you come home, it is habit. You will sit at your computer and play Dota for two hours a night, or you will sit at your computer and play Rocket League for two hours a night. World of Warcraft for 20 hours a night. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's <laughs> autopilot. And 20 it actually, hours. It, you actually 40 hours start to get some of your social experiences out of this. Like for me, I play Rocket League with people. <clears throat> it is actually a social thing. It's how I interact with people is while I play Rocket League. It's actually ingrained in the way that my life was being lived. And back in the day, my brother and I would, the whole reason we were on WoW is because we were from a tiny little farm community in the middle of corn, and that's the only way we got socialization out of the, like, 12 people that lived in the town, is we'd jump on WoW and play with guys from Australia or New Zealand or Idaho, you know, exotic places like that. The exotic subcontinent exotic. of Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Idaho. <laughs> Known world oh. famous for their potatoes damn one of 10 right. people you played with was one of 20 people in the state yes <laughs> but um yeah so that's pretty much been it and i that game's going to be bad for me because i just enjoy it way too much and i play it way too much but that's all i've been playing um oh actually i lied has been heroes been playing a lot of that since um buddy zach's in town he's actually teaching me how to play the game because there were some mechanics to it that i just completely didn't know about okay and huh. it really changes the way so like your enemies have stamina each time you hit them they lose one stamina and when they have no stamina that's when your hits do damage um there's a way and once that's you do weird. once you do damage the, all their stamina comes back okay so hmm. like you have to coordinate so you combo them you can combo them. Like, let's say someone has five stamina. Mm -hmm. You have a three hit guy, a two hit guy, and a one hit guy. You hit him with the three hit. You okay. hit him with the two hit. He has no stamina and he's now stunned. Mm -hmm. You come in with the one and he hits him hard and he does real damage. Well, something I didn't hmm. realize, or if you do two threes, you'll hit him with the very last hit. Okay. What I didn't realize is if someone is stunned and you uh, perfectly take out all their stamina and nothing extra, the very next hit will reduce their maximum stamina. So instead of being recharged to five, they'll get recharged to four. Oh. So you can eventually work a guy down to where he has no stamina. And then every hit you do is pure damage. Okay. All right. I did nice. not know of this mechanic. And it has changed the way that I play that game. I was going to say, it sounds pretty valuable. Oh, oh God, yes. Um, <laughs> the fact that I ever beat a playthrough without knowing that feels more mm. and more like luck the more I've been playing the game. Hmm. I, I love those moments, especially in roguelikes, where, where it finally clicks. You finally understand. Yeah. In, uh, in Spelunky, and I, I don't think I'm quite there yet, because I, I still screw up with Spelunky. Um, but the, the moment I realized that, hey, Spelunky is not a speedrun. It's not like, you know, a roguelike where you go as fast as you can. You sit, you take your time, and you watch what happens first. I was like, oh my god, I'm finally beating levels. I'm completing things. I don't have to run through this. And then that bomb accidentally yeah. kills the shopkeeper and yeah. you're fucked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of Spelunky, did you ever see the documentaries by a, a YouTube channel called Noclip? They did, one, um, they did one for Rocket League and then they did a couple for Doom, the new Doom. I saw the Doom one. That's one of my favorites, okay. but I did not now, know they did Spelunky. Yeah. yeah, they're working on Spelunky now. That's the next one that they're going to do. And they also did The Witness. So that would be watch interesting. That one. Actually, yeah. I, you posted that the other day. I did post that. I haven't watched it yet, but I did post it. I will be watching that because I am in a tiny hotel sized apartment until I find my <laughs> big sized apartment. Splunky is an interesting game to me. I, it's a game that I enjoyed the idea of. I enjoy playing, but it never hooked me. Mm. I have not been able to get more than I think I'm like 10 hours into the game. 
and oh, okay. it never clicked. I never like had that eureka moment where I realized this is how I need to play this. We're like, mm. Isaac, um, I sucked, I sucked, I sucked, I sucked, and bam, there it is. It just opened up. I get it. I never, like what you were saying with Splunky, it never yeah. happened with me. I've gotten decent far, but it's because I sheer will and brute fucking force. Yeah. Not because I actually was good. Yeah, one game I would love to get more into, and actually you played the hell out of this back in the day, uh, is Rogue Legacy. Kind of a Castlevania-esque roguelike. Um, it's, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's got uh, pseudo non-roguelike features where you can lock down the uh, the level structure uh, if you want to by paying like gold tax or something uh but and it reduces your gold yield for that yeah. run too it's it's one of the the roguelikes i've always wanted to get into but i always die too quickly it's a game that it's roguelike in that every run you do will um be different but it's not purely roguelike because you are you do have an RPG element on the back end that you're upgrading this castle that will make your base players stronger and unlock new base players. So you actually do improve your character over time. And by the time you beat the game, your base level players are substantially better than what they were when they started. I think I'm going to have to go back to that this week. Um... And, and try to play that again. My entire gaming library has just changed to low-powered devices uh, thanks to uh, all my gaming stuff being packed up. So you're, you're going to probably see a lot of weird stuff coming from me in the next few weeks. Yeah, that, <laughs> and it's always a fun time. It's a good palate cleanse, and then whenever you come back, you're like, what the fuck was I playing this for? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just... It's really good. Like whenever I first came out here, I was playing like Monster Hunter Try or not Try Generations, which that was something I have a bone to pick with that game. It is such a good game. I don't know why the fuck they're keeping it buried on a handheld console. They need to port Generations over to the Switch. They needed yeah. to give it a major console release. Monster Hunter Try was great and I could play it on the Wii. I could sit on my fucking couch and play it on my TV. Generations is a good game, but unless you pull out your 3DS, you cannot play it. I, I love Monster Hunter. I, I should rephrase that. I love the idea of Monster Hunter. I love all the YouTube videos and Twitch streams I've seen. I love the reviews I've watched of it. I've never played a Monster Hunter game. I haven't either. I'm not great at them. I mean, there is a legit, like, this is how you're supposed to play Monster Hunter. I'm not that guy, but I enjoy mm -hmm. them thoroughly. I love the, you kill these. It's kind of, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Zero Dawn has a little slight element to this. You kill certain monsters to get certain things that so you can trade them in to get certain armor or so you can make certain potions or ammo okay. with it. So every monster you kill gives you something unique that you can use to make something. As well as there's things in the environment that you can go out and get. And it's, it's a really good game it's just it doesn't suit well for the handheld mode because every time you go out into the wild it's a 50 minute timer oh. for a mission and 50 oh, minutes that's it, bad. is a yeah. little too big for the idea of i'm on a bus going to work yep yeah and you can't save in the middle of it i mean i guess technically if you close the 3ds it'll pause and yeah yeah it's kind yeah. of a workaround though it's not doesn't really yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way the game is built. It is made to be digested in solid-sized chunks like a lot of console games, yet it is on a platform mm -hmm. that is best made for, like, Pokemon. I run through the weeds, I beat five Pokemon, I turn the game back off. It yeah. took me five minutes, yeah. and I progressed. Monster yeah. Hunter, you can't progress unless you put a solid maybe 30 minutes if you run it quick up to an hour to do a mission. With uh, all the management around all this moving stuff, that's basically been the only games I've been playing this week that I've played too little to mention because I'll have five, ten minutes between phone calls or managing people or uh, whatever else I had to do to get ready for this thing. Uh, and it's surprising mm -hmm. how few games don't have these bite-sized play sessions. Uh, I really yeah. wish more games had that option where I could turn something on play for five minutes, feel like I've made actual tangible progress, and then walk away from it. But, right. you know, the, the games I'm interested in are, you know, these, these giant games that uh, apparently 
you know, the, the minimum play session is one to two hours, which just doesn't work for me right now. Yes. I'll tell you what the perfect game for you right now would be, Tom, is Lee Chess. Yes. Given like yes, a correspondence chess, which I sent Eric a challenge the other day. Oh, oh, really? I don't so, think he responded for hmm, that. So. so all went quiet. He must be scared. All went quiet on the Western Front. I was kicking <laughs> everyone's ass so much, no one would respond to my challenges. So I just uninstalled the app. I will, so yeah, I will respond. Yeah. If you guys are that masochistic that you want to keep going at this, I will reinstall <laughs> the app and we Whatever. will show you what it's all about to play chess. We're going to do this and we're going to stream it. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I can stream Lee Chess on this laptop. That's what we're going to do. That's the only thing I can stream. If you want to stream oh, chess, God. we can just do an actual live stream. I'll get a board and I'll show the world how much of a fraud you are at chess. We'll, we'll do this. We will do this. But either way, <laughs> that's chess. Um, so given the situation with us not having as much playing because of logistical issues and sickness mm. issues, uh, we decided that we would kind of dive into a topic that I've been beating around in my head for a while because I've been bit by it. I've been blessed by it and it's fucking everywhere now. Um, the world of early access games is here. It's to stay. It's going nowhere. And in several different ways. In several different ways. Yeah. It's, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, I think everyone that's listening to this, everyone here for sure, is very familiar with early access. We've either bought them, we've seen them, we've watched them, we've hated them. We've made personal creeds against buying anything with the early access label on them, but then turn around when there's a game made by a developer that you really love and like, oh, it's early access. I probably shouldn't do this. I swore to myself I'd never hurt myself again. We buy it anyway and then remember, remember why we did or why we didn't buy early access games ever again. It's, I, the, the quality varies wildly, and uh, there's a whole lot to talk about here. A whole lot to talk about. So, so where do you want to dive yeah. into first? Because we've got, oh my god, there's so much to cover with this topic. <laughs> so one thing I want to throw out is that not all early access is the same. Right. Um, there has been early access for some time since the internet era, but it's not what you see on Steam today. Um, in fact, Nintendo just had one. Uh, closed and open betas. They are a thing that has existed for a long time. Yeah. And they serve a very good purpose. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I have uh, played them and realized that, hey, this game is not what I think it's going to be. And I bailed on it, such as Rainbow Six Siege. I got in on the uh, second closed beta and I was like, this is not quite what I was hoping for. And so I never bought the game. Yeah. Um, uh, My brother... um got in on the Elder Scrolls Online beta because he loved Mm -hmm. the Elder Scrolls series. He was and still is an avid World of Warcraft player putting in, you know, something around 7,000 hours per week into World of Warcraft, probably about 20,000 hours per week into World of Warcraft. Um, And he, he played the closed beta and absolutely hated every minute of it. He said this is a cheap, watered down WoW ripoff. Now, from what I understand, they changed it somewhat, but um, uh, you know, game developers use playtesting because that's the only way you can figure out how the thing you made sucks or doesn't suck. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to have someone else play your creation. You have to have someone else look at your art and tell you why it's valid or why it's not. Um, you, with When you build something, and we've all built, been there, we've all made something, we've all had the, the macaroni pictures on the fridge, right? And someone will tell you it's the greatest thing in the world. And then the art critic comes in and slaps it down off the fridge and they said, this is shit. This is absolute dog shit. Um, right. You should absolutely never make anything art worthy again. Uh, and then you as a kindergartner sob in your room for the next 16 years until you become a punk rock emo star. <laughs> How the fuck did I, you go down that rabbit wow, hole? Don't even yeah. question wow. it. So what the fuck just happened there? <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm um, not worried. But yeah, game game, game no. developers use playtesting to figure out what to change in their game and what they can tune up and make better. Um, as well as there's um, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Adam. There, there's a couple of aspects that I really like about early access. Um. De- definitely the play testing too because when you have like an open beta or uh, even an open alpha 
you've got a limited amount of time for a whole bunch of people to play this game. Um, you've got a whole big variety of systems that it's being played on. You're going to get a lot of bug reports, uh, things that a studio probably just doesn't have the the people to do. Yes. And um, and it also gives people like a, a small taste of the game when you have that limited timed, you know, this weekend or for this whole week or whatever it is. You know, here's our game. Maybe it's not the full game. Maybe it's just one mode or one level or something like that. And it 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 builds it both markets the game and helps to improve the game. And this is a particularly uh, Battlefield Three was one that I got into. They yes. did that open beta. They did that open beta for what was it like a week? I think it was a little two longer weeks. than that. Yeah, yeah it was like it was a uh, maybe two. Or, yeah, it was a pretty long open beta. And what it was is limited maps right wasn't there one or two maps there was two maps and limited guns you couldn't unlock everything so you got a good taste of the game you can see how it runs on your system um it got me hooked and then i purchased the game it worked and And they made they made weapon balancing fixes between the beta and release and stuff like that too and um a couple big things about it it was free so you don't have to Mm -hmm. pay Mm -hmm. because the developers are getting just as much out of as you are and yeah. as Tom said, with Battlefield, there was a big thing that they were selling of this destructive environment. And not just walls, but like you could just dig holes into the ground with grenades and use them like foxholes. And in yeah. this beta, they realized that people could glitch out of the maps in this. So thanks to the beta, they were able to completely patch this out of the game before the game ever went live. Because it was yep. game breaking how bad that bug was. And this, yes. this, that's an important distinction to make. So their open beta, their early access period, was completely free. You didn't have to pay to walk in that door. Um, especially if you're building a multiplayer game. Uh, and Nintendo just did this that we talked about uh, you know, last podcast or a couple ago uh, with Splatoon. Yes. They said, okay, you can, you can download this client. Everyone can jump in for free. Um, and that way... If you have, if you offer people a game for free, online play for free, for even a limited amount of time, you say, please hammer our servers, you're going to get mm-hmm. way more response and way better data yes. out of, you know, actual load testing than you would otherwise. Because glitches that happen in a game uh, with 400 people might not happen in a, you know, a server with four people, for instance. Weird, odd load issues can happen, especially with server side physics and, yes. and stuff like that. And there was some interesting stuff that they did with um, Splatoon, which I thought was odd at first. And the more I thought about it, it was actually really smart by Nintendo. They only had people allowed to play for hour windows. And it was like there was only three hour windows through a day. And I'm just thinking, this is really stupid. It really limits how much I can Mm -hmm. play. And then as soon as that hour started, I was there. I was in. I was playing. I was playing. I was playing. The hour was done. I was done. And then it hit me. Everyone was doing that. By condensing yeah. it down to one hour, they were able to maximize their load testing as well as make sure there's enough players to keep constant matches and low or wait times for matches to a minimum. So the players would get the best possible experience for one hour and they could get the true load test that they would ever get. Those hours during this beta are hitting harder than anything they will ever get the rest of that game's life when it releases. Yeah, that's really smart. And when you when you mentioned that a couple of weeks ago that they were going to do it an hour at a time, I'm like that's dumb. How many people are going to miss out on that? But that's actually a really good point I didn't think about. You will schedule your time a little bit at least for yeah. one of the hours, and that's what right. I did. 1 hour on a Saturday mm-hmm. at noon. I was like I'm going to be doing nothing so I can try this out. Yeah. It also gets your hype ready for your Twitch audience. So everyone knew at this point in time, I need to be on Twitch and I need to be watching the Splatoon streams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nintendo did great with that marketing as well as it probably gave them really good numbers. But so, I mean, that's the good type. I I don't want to say it like that. That is the best type of early access. It's the old school traditional paradigm of open beta or open closed beta alphas. Free to players. Players give you the metrics you need to improve the game before it's released. And and what that used to also do was allow them to fix the game before a physical release. Yeah. So they don't send out physical editions that are broke, which is really nice, especially for them. That's definitely the the form of of early access I like and I approve of. Way back in the day, a physical PC game releases. Remember those days? I, I think it was back in the 1920s. 
where they actually <laughs> they, they printed physical uh, plastic discs uh, with game content on it and, and put it into, uh, into general stores uh, run by uh, old Bill d- down at the mill. Um, and they would have to fix all those bugs before they pushed it out because patches were fairly expensive to distribute and not all of your players would have them. So with uh, Medal of Honor, for instance, back on the PC, you would go to something like Filefront or GameSpot Files or a random gaming website that would have these patches available for download. Uh, a lot of the times the manufacturers or the, the developers wouldn't even offer them on their site themselves. Uh, your games wouldn't auto patch. You would have to download a new installer, which, mm-hmm. you know, back in the day of shitty DSL, sometimes that was pretty non-trivial. A 200 meg patch was insane, you know, right? That was, that was a good chunk of the disc you just bought. So patches had to be slim. They had to fix as much stuff before shipping as possible. Uh, mm-hmm. Now that you can fix it whenever... Uh, I haven't seen as many open betas, but that could just be my perception. Open betas at this point, I think, are more for preparing your launch day load. How many servers you got? Right. And if you're yeah. EA for SimCity 4, not enough is the answer. Yeah. Um, uh, v. Dobby um, <laughs> brought up something I thought was interesting. He was asking how early access differs from episodic games similar to like how Telltale does. And I think there's one big distinction is during early access games, what you're playing will be changing. This is something that is a living, breathing game that is going to be altered. Things that you're using right now may get patched out of the game. Things that you're doing may get patched to change. Whereas in a Telltale game, that episode you download is done. What you're playing, if you go back and replay it a month from now, will be the same exact experience. Mm-hmm. It's episodic, not evolving. Episodic content is more for um, here's the story we want to tell, and we're going to break this into chunks because we know we don't have uh, enough development money to shove it all out the gate right up front. So, so we're gonna yeah. we're gonna take in some money, right? Get some breathing room, uh, you know, work month to month on our paychecks, uh, and, <laughs> and we're gonna pay this month of rent, and then we're gonna do some more work and pay the next month of rent. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's more of a, a stage gate monetary policy than it is content or, or a bug fixing policy. And yeah. this gets us into the other yes. type of early access because there right. is one similarity there. Episodic games helps, especially Telltale at first, not anymore. But at first, it helped fund the studio to keep going. If the first mm-hmm. episode they ever made, I don't know if it was uh, Walking Dead was their first or if they had something else before. I, they've been in business a long time. But if the very first of a studio is doing episodic and their first episode sucks, that studio may not live to put out a second episode. Right. If people it's, don't right. care about your, about your pilot of your great new TV show that you put out, no one's going to give a shit if the rest of the series is amazing. And that is where the dangerous limbo with early access is. Some games are early access for the sake of getting the money to be able to develop. Other games this can yeah, this go. can go real bad. Yes, this this can, is where this is where people can be felt ripped off or lied to. This is similar to it's kind of similar to how some games will have like a Kickstarter, and then when the game comes out, it's nothing what people expected. Yep, as in uh, Planetary Annihilation had a lot of issues with that. Yes, I think, though, to me, Kickstarters differ a little from early access because Kickstarters, mm-hmm. you were... Yeah. Pl- oh, no, they do. It's more of a blind just, pledge. Yeah. No, it's completely different, but I'm just saying that there's that same aspect of of you have these expectations of this game to be done, and it might not ever get done, but you've already put a bunch of money into it. Yeah. And a lot of these early access games are not cheap. It's not like you're spending five bucks to get access to this game. You might be spending upwards of 30, 40, 50 bucks sometimes. There was, there was famously, uh, and, and this is our you know, wallpaper's namesake, uh, Kerbal mm-hmm. Space Program, uh, when mm-hmm. they were in early access, the price started out fairly low. I want to say it was 10 or 15 bucks when it came out. Uh, but as they mm-hmm. got closer and closer to their you know, 1.0 release date, the price would increase by you know five bucks every couple of weeks. Or As five it bucks should a, exactly because you were paying for more of a game. The people who mm-hmm. trusted the developers up front got a discount. They, it was a thank you from the developers to the community. We know this isn't done. We're still working on it, and if you give us money, we're going to keep working on it because we can feed our kids now. 
as mm. well as um, this differs from Planetary Annihilation, where Planetary Annihilation gave you the game, uh, if you kickstarted, you got it a little cheaper. But as it got closer, the price went up as, as that. Mm. But the big difference is there was an issue with the game and they realized it. They made a huge update. And then now all these people who kickstarted it, all these people who went to early access had more to buy. Yeah. There was no reward for the loyalty in that situation. Whereas Kerbal, there was the reward of a low entry cost that will rise over time for this game. As well as they had a level of transparency that most early access don't, that they had a very functional playable demo for free. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was great. Uh, and one of the first, uh, and I want to say only, but I'm probably wrong on that, early access demos available where they said, hey, here's kind of what the game looks like. Um, have at it. And they were very upfront with their pricing model. They said, hey, our game is you know, cheap if you buy it early, but if you mm -hmm. don't, it's, it's going to be more expensive. And that's, that's less of right. buy it today because you might not be able to tomorrow. It's, right. <laughs> it's very upfront about what they're selling you. They're saying, hey, look, Here's right. the shitty little macaroni thing. It's going to be the Mona Lisa one day, but here's the shitty macaroni thing. Please, for the love of God, give us some money. We have kids to feed. And <laughs> there's another approach that I like that I feel similar, but I know Dobby was a little upset by it. Uh, Disc Jam um, took the internet by storm a couple months ago. It's been kind of dormant now, but it's still a good game. Its early access period was fully playable and free. 100% free. But soon as that game became full, they pulled it from you and you had to buy it, which I'm okay with. I think if you're in early access and you offer it to me for free, I have absolutely no expectations that you're going to give me a discount or anything. I was playing yeah. a free game in return to give you my critique on what you're doing. I've, I've got some, some small issues with that, but it's, it's not with what the developers were doing. I think they absolutely have that right, but I think it hurts themselves in the end. So Disc Jam, I thought it was fun. I, I liked the game, mm -hmm. but because I played it, and, and now, you know, I haven't played it since. I played it for that, you know, the couple days I did, and I was done with it. If I launched it tomorrow and I found out, oh, I have to pay, I'd be like, I don't really want to. So now your most of your install base is going to walk away from it, not knowing that the full game's got way, way, way more content now. It's way more polished. It's way more finished. That's and that's actually a big core issue I want to talk about with early access games. But if the Disc Jam people were up front and they said, hey, this is going to be free until we decide to launch it. Mm -hmm. That's okay, right? As a consumer, that's all right, as long as you're up front with me. If they just yanked the rug out from under me and said, hey, your game doesn't work anymore, give me cash, <laughs> that's a shitty right. thing to do. I don't think it's shitty, though, because it was early access. You should not expect developers to put thousands of hours into a game and say, here it is for free. Right. They didn't say the game was free for this period. They just said, this is the open beta. Well, and technically, it's it was a beta a, of the game. Technically, it was a closed beta. It was, there was no well, barrier yeah. to entry, but it was a closed right. beta because you had to establish contact to them to get the code. Right. But I, as discomforting as that could be to people to all of a sudden, I don't have it anymore. I think mm -hmm. that's still a decent way of handling it because they were, they, were, they didn't lie to you. Um, DLAS pulls up an example of something that was a two faced lie that is very sour. <laughs> Um, H1Z1 did something that I feel we will see more of. They had a Kickstarter or early access, and the idea was you're paying to play this early, but when it's released, this is going to be a free game. And then it went from this is going to be free to, okay, we are actually going to pay for it. Okay, you made that decision. That's fine. I can kind of go with it. People already paid, so they're not really out. And then all of a sudden, they split it into two games. And you had to buy the split. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I no, that's I entirely, this entirely shitty. So did the people who paid for the, the early access have to buy both of them to keep playing? Like they could no longer play and they had to buy one of the two games to keep playing yeah, I again? I think um, um, the chat will correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know yeah. which one it was, but it wasn't a choose one. It was you now have this. This is what you purchased. 
and we split okay. off this other game that you now have to buy. Yeah, that's, and this game that's was shitty. originally a part of this, and we were saying, "Fuck you!" It's no longer there. Okay, that's See, absolutely I don't like shitty. That. I don't like that at all. <clears throat> so it, it, it might would... not be a cash grab. The developers could mm-hmm. say, "Hey, this has." core functionality that could absolutely be expanded into a standalone title. It's no longer just a multiplayer mode. This is an entire game unto itself. They could have absolutely valid reasons, and especially valid marketing reasons, saying some players prefer this experience, an entirely different demographic prefers this one, and our core feature of game A doesn't necessarily fit with demographic B, so we're going to split it. Totally reasonable. But you fuck over your players when you remove functionality. You fuck over your yeah. console owners when you remove functionality, Sony. Uh, you, you do not patch out shit that you have promised to people that you put in your game that people expect to be in your game. Uh, when you start removing features, and it's not like you know tightening your game onto, onto a, a core set of uh, features or, or, or core gameplay. That's entirely mm-hmm. different. But when people are actively using a mode, and you remove it just because you think you can make more money from it, that's absolutely shitty. And there was a caveat. I was mistaken a little bit. I realize it's correct to me. If you had already purchased it, you did get both. At a certain, by a certain date, if yeah. you had purchased it. So, um, but there's, it's still the idea of, we promise you this, we're now doing that, and there wasn't the transparency. Right. And that's the frustrating thing about it. And that's, mm-hmm. um, to me, there's some tells when you're going into early access. Um, when you're about to buy into a game, you should be able to go and see what are your development plans? What are you planning mm-hmm. to do with this game? And be able to see a very detailed, concise, this is what we want to do. If yeah. you don't see that, it is a pretty big red flag. Do not go. Yeah. So. With with early access, one of the biggest issues that I've seen, uh, and I've, I've actually personally experienced this with several games, including the great game Prison Architect, uh, which I did buy in early access. It's a wonderful, fantastic game. I bought it in early access. I got it right away. Um, and I played it when it was probably 40, 50% done. When the game actually came out, when they had their big 1.0 celebration, we're, we're releasing it, it's done, here's the full price game, you've got it now, and I had it sitting there in my Steam library, I already felt like I've played this game already. I'm done with it, I don't need to go back here. Even though I've seen literally less than half the content the game has to offer. <laughs> but I've already played it, I've already done everything I want to do in that game, even though I haven't done everything. It's a weird Mm -hmm. mental dissonance that you work yourself into because you feel like you're treading old ground, even though the ground's been, you know, completely paved over and now there's a shopping mall there. Yeah. I feel that um, Prison Architect was actually one of the good ones, though. To me, a simulation-based game is something that I won't play a lot of, but I will go back to at random times. And Prison Architect is one of them. When I first bought it, I put in about like five hours. I didn't touch it again for a month, and then I came back to it again. It's definitely yeah. going to be kind of a phasey thing for me. It's not something yeah. I'll play solid. Yeah, I did. I did that with the Forest, which was it was weird for me because the Forest was on Steam sales for like every time they do a sale, it would go on sale. But it was early access. It was pretty early into the access too. And that's but it, some... was, it wasn't expensive. It was like 10 bucks. I got it on sale for 10 bucks. I've put like 20 hours into it, probably. But this game is still getting regular updates. I, get, I see it in Steam all the time. Um, they're, they're giving regular updates. A lot of them are pretty, pretty good updates. Fairly big, fairly big updates. But I played this game a lot when I got it, and I have not played it very much since. But every now and then, I pick it back up to see how much more they added. I check the stuff out. I keep up on it a little bit. And then maybe once it releases, I'll play it another 10 hours or so. Maybe. My only fear with, with early access, and especially with, with that problem in particular, is mm-hmm. that I feel that, depending on the type of game... Um, yes, and very much. Depending on your audience, right? Because some, 
some segments of your audience will go back to a singular game over and over and over again to try to extract the maximum amount of playtime out right. of it that they can. Uh, with, with some games, you're artificially limiting your, your audience, right? Because people like me, we're going to play it, we're done with it, and we're never going to go back. It's done. We're, we're finished with it. Mm -hmm. um, especially with a game that relies heavily on multiplayer. Yes. Which we've all seen. We've seen, you know, the early access crowd jump on top of this great multiplayer shooter that has so much promise and it's going to be so amazing. And Irk and I have firsthand experience with this in several VR games where it was great for the first two weeks we had the Vive. And yeah. after that, there's four people playing and that's literally it. Because the game's in early access, everyone's like, okay, well, we've seen all we have to see of this. We're done with it. And the community evaporates because now you've got. I don't want to, this isn't really a term, but you've got, you know, time segmentation of your audience, uh, mm -hmm. of, your, of your user base, which yeah. entirely destroys a multiplayer game. And I think that's what's happening to Disc Jam. Yeah, absolutely. I think Disc Jam got hurt a little bit by it. Um, I think that's the game will have staying power with its community. Um, I mean, yeah. let's, let's be honest here. We know of Windjammers. Windjammers is not a mainstream game. It is not a game that is loved by everyone. It was like what a Neo right. Geo game. It, it was, should be loved by everyone. Yes, it but should it's be. Not. It's a great game. <laughs> it's, it's a niche game is what I'm getting at. Rocket yeah. League is yeah, not yeah. niche. This it was, though. It, it caught fire, though. It was something new. This yeah. jam is trying to play on nostalgia of a base of people that's not as large as it needs to be for them to be playing strictly off nostalgia. Mm -hmm. True. Very true. And that's just, and also I wanted to say, VR, early access, I think is a lot different than um, regular early access, mainly yes. because yes. VR, yeah, they're, they're you have so 200,000 players to play with in all right. of VR world. More importantly, though, it's not like a developer goes, okay, we're building a game. Oh my God, what's this thing with all these buttons on it in this weird, <laughs> uh, like, object that you hold in your right hand and it's got three buttons in this weird wheel thing, right? We, we know how to build games for hunks of plastic and, mouth and mice and keyboards. Mm -hmm. Building something for, well, we've got these two weird wand things and a face monitor. How the fuck do we use this, right? Early access in VR is kind of a given because you're building mm -hmm. quite literally experiences that have never been built before. And right. this is also what I'm trying to say is VR, even if the game's not early access, it's, it's going to feel access. early access because VR in itself, yeah. people who have VR are like us. We're cutting edge. We want new shit. We are willing to live with the pain. We're willing to pay more than what we should <laughs> for something we're going to yeah. use less than what we tell ourselves we will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what we pay for. It's going to be a dead community more than half the time until a game like Rec Room comes out that the entire community mm -hmm. surrounds. And then you'll be able to play online with players. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that's kind of that, the same thing you're, you deal with with VR is what I'm worried about with a game like Battlegrounds. Because this game has gotten a lot of attention very quickly in early access. And those are, there are 100 people per match. In matches, so what's going to happen instant. by the time it comes out? How many, of the, how many people are still going to be playing this game? Exactly. That's a huge problem with early and access. And that's a 30 dollar early access game. It's so, this time the, segmentation what, problem. Yeah. It's yeah. riding the wave. This game is mm -hmm. sold over a million copies. It is riding the yeah. wave of early access. It's doing without. well so far. Now, There's always at least like seven people on my friends list playing this game at all times. Well, just get, think of it this way: a hundred people, and there is literally two seconds to find a hundred yeah. people, and you only wait yeah, sixty seconds for people to load in. It's not waiting yeah. to find them, it's loading them in. Right, yeah. But that game will die down. There is no way it maintains, absolutely no way. I'm no. on the record right now, that player base will be two thirds <laughs> reduced by the time this game comes out. I completely agree. That said, that's still gonna be a big player base. It, You're going yeah. to have 10,000 people playing that game at a time, and that is more than enough. My, my only question is, is really on the developer's side, which is, mm -hmm. 
if if you look at something like like Planetary Annihilation, which they did, um, or Battlegrounds in the future, and you say, okay, we put out this early access game, people loved it for the first month, two months, three months, six months that it was out, and now mm -hmm. they're gone, right? All these people have left for other games because we've been around too long, we're not the hot thing anymore. Do you uh -huh. cut your losses and run, Planetary Annihilation style, or do you keep trying to resuscitate your dead product and keep pouring all of this money into it? Or do you just say, yeah, it was early access, yeah, we're never going to finish it, it's done and you abandon the community you have left in order to make your next big thing? And, and that's, that's a hard question for developers, but it could easily fall yeah. either way. With Planetary Annihilation side, they said, yeah, we're done with this, we're releasing a second game with the same kind of stuff in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen other early access games where they keep trying to nurse this dead product back to life, and it's just never going to take. Right. And I will... So, oh, go ahead, Adam. This, this is something I wanted to bring up, actually, with Battlegrounds specifically. So you've got this early access game that's it's feature complete, is what they call it. So, you know, what's in the game is pretty much there, unless they decide to add more stuff in future updates, which any game would do with patches anyway. But this game has all the mechanics done, you know, it's got one map, it's got all the guns, everything works. There's no major game-breaking bugs necessarily. Most of them are pretty much taken care of. There's some graphical bugs, things like that. So the rest of the early access portion is going to be bug fixes, stuff like that, optimizations. Now, with a $30 early access game, what if they don't? finish it is that yeah. the same as say releasing a buggy game and never patching it i think it is and it then comes down to how much did you pay and right. what kind of product is it when it's done if battlegrounds so was to announce this is 1.0 with no more updates mm -hmm. for the price yep. i think it's fair i would agree with what i've seen yeah not bad uh, one, one thing I do want to bring up, um, and this is, this is a problem, um, I won't say exclusive, but mostly exclusive uh, to multiplayer games that are in early access, or long-running games like World of Warcraft had this issue, um, where the mechanics of the game evolve over time and they leave old players behind. So World of Warcraft, in its, in its inception, right, um, was, okay, here's your game, here's your few set of simple mechanics and systems to learn, go forth and do. And then you did, and, you, you know, if you took a break from WoW for a year or two and you came back to it, the game's entirely different. You've got all of these new systems to manage, you've got all this new tutorial shit to read through. The way you played the game before, none of it applies because everything has changed, which is to be expected in an MMO, but early access games also have this problem. The way you play the game on day one is not the way you play the game on day 100 or even day 12. It can mm. completely change. And then you have the opposite problem for new players, which is they come into World of Warcraft, uh, probably not today because they've done a lot of simplification, but a couple years ago, you come into World of Warcraft as a new player and they're like, okay, here's your 12 texts to read through. Here's your textbook, here's your professor, here's your college course, and here's exactly how you have to build your warrior if you want to do any high-level raids. They hand you all this and they say, we'll see you back in two weeks when you have your shit figured out, thank you. Uh, new players can't get into this because now there's systems on top of systems, on top of broken shit, on top of more systems to fix the broken shit. And old players can't get into it because this, everything they knew back then is now wrong. It's a big problem in early access games, and it's it's takes a really curated developer to call features that don't work and avoid adding stuff that overcomplicates the experience. I th think that this is where you need to look at the development logs to see what's planned for this game, because in early access, you should expect the game to change to a degree. This is early access because the developer is telling you a lot of times we're not 100% sure what we're going to be doing here. We have this premise and it's playable so far. Give us money so we can keep building it. And then what may have been a third person cover based shooter may turn into a third person action adventure with some platforming. I mean, it's it's how early access can go because the developer is still fleshing out the game. 
Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Um, it, but while it's fair, it's also a problem for the multiplayer community who may or may not stick with your game because of the substantial changes to the mechanics. It, it'll happen. But I think that is the nature of the beast. You need to see what is the developer planning for this game and then understand this is early access. Right. Uh, this is the, not a finished game that you are expecting that I know what I'm buying. Early access is roll the dice. I hope this turns out the way I hope. And that's, that's one of the big problems I've seen with early access is a lot of developers use early access to try to gauge the marketplace, which I don't think is the right or appropriate use of early access or, or uh, you know, paid betas, where you say, hey, I'm going to put out basically a tech demo for 20 bucks. Buy it if you want to see more games like this. And then they go, OK, people are really interested in brown cover based shooters. We should make more of that. And, you know, in, instead of. Some developers might go ahead and build the early access game. Some developers might say, okay, well, that's cool. We'll never update that because there's literally nothing they can do to hurt us if we don't. There's no repercussions because they've put more than an hour into the game. We get off scot-free and everyone else has paid 20 bucks for jack shit while we make Call of Duty 9. I don't think you ever have to worry about major publishers getting in the, the pay for early access. I think that they're yeah. structurally against it. They will do open betas, closed alphas, but I don't think they will ever do that kind of thing with an early access because they're honestly, their stockholders, their program managers won't let them go into a game that, that ambiguous. They need right. it locked down. I th- well, I- they've, they've got a bigger market. They've got more money to pour into it. And they've got, you know, industry formulas you know you can do these kind of things and be safe and make money and you can't do these kind of things because it's too risky and it might be too niche or too but but you know, if, if i'm if i'm an ea executive why wouldn't i say mm-hmm. sure we're gonna put this this very small pile of money that we spend on like maxwell house every day for the ea offices make a proof of concept put it out on early access and see what sells. And by the way, Steam's not the only thing that does this. Sony has or will soon provide early access on the PlayStation Network. Um, why, why wouldn't you say, okay, developers, make a proof of concept, build it in a month, push it out to the stores, see if people are even interested in an idea like this. Because while you may have a jaded view of EA and other companies like that, big corporations care about their namesake. If you don't like microtransactions, they may not care about that. But they're not going to be seen as a company that abandons games. A big publisher will not do that unless they lose funding. It takes a huge thing for a big company to be willing to say, nope, we're not doing that. Here's here's Tom putting on his nefarious hacker hat. So if I'm (laughs) EA, I spin off a child company called Bullshit Publisher Games. And I put out a piece of shit on Steam without the EA name attached anywhere, right? They could easily do this with puppet companies. Easily. It it could happen. I'm not saying it it does or it will. They could easily knock on my door and give me a million dollars. I'm just saying it's a possibility to use early access as a way to gauge market reception to certain ideas. They have teaser trailers for that. That's all they need to do (laughs) is release a teaser trailer, see how many views you get, see what social media says about it. Okay, we're making the game. Yeah. It's exactly what From Software just did. They had absolutely no footage, no anything in that goddamn video for that game, and it's getting tons of views, so they've just realized it doesn't matter what the fuck we make, it's gonna sell. To be fair, From Software could put out, like, a, a, a full version of Yaris for the Xbox 360. Did you guys ever play the worst game in existence? No. Oh no, my god, I don't it was think so. so fucking bad. Toyota <laughs> made a, uh, a demo not even a demo, a full free game on Xbox Live Arcade called Yaris. And it was basically a giant ad for their shitty car. And it was rated one of the (laughs) worst games of all time. It was. Wasn't there, wasn't there a seven up game? Cool spot, and yeah. it's actually yeah. good. Thank you for the Genesis. Much. Is it actually good? Yes. I don't remember it I being played good. played the shit out of cool yes, spot that, as a kid. That awesome. was the era when everyone decided our mascot needs to have a video game because they're oh my yep. Zoid. Yeah, uh, the Zoid had one. Uh, the Seven Up had one. Uh, I was, uh, was remember the intro to uh, the kids. Uh, oh no! Um, 
what was the name of that show? Now I can't even think of the name of the show. Tim the Toolman Taylor. Oh, uh, Home Improvement. Yeah. Home Improvement. Uh, remember the intro to remember the intro to that show showed like a, a video game part? It was like a portion. Yeah, yeah. yeah it it showed like the side scroller, the dude jumping over the saw or whatever. I was always as a kid, I'd watch that show all the time. I'd be like, man, I, I want that game. Is that game? Is that a real game? Does that exist? I want to play this. Was was that ever an actual game? Did no, they have like a no. promotional know old game or anything? Not that I know of. If they had a promotional game, that. it would be like a safety <laughs> instructional game yeah. where you're Tim plugging forks into outlets and hammering your toe. <laughs> no, but, it just looked like a bad platformer. But anyway, From Software could release Yaris at full sixty dollars, and I would buy it without a second thought. It'd be like, hmm, From Software released a game. Yes, please. Here's my wallet. Could I get the collector's <laughs> edition with the GameStop exclusive content? Yeah. Lube? No, I don't need that. Thank you. Right. But either way, I think um, we're um, pretty off the rails when it comes to that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, rails. Fuck them. Who needs them? So, so, so from software, uh, put out a trailer. Oh, yeah. yeah. So if you didn't catch that uh, from software is teasing a new game. Um, all that they had in there was a nod to something referencing Dark Souls 1, and it says, prepare to dine at yep. the end of the trailer. Yep. It's animated. It shows a dude with a sword running at like some <laughs> demon guy, and that's it. It may or may not have werewolves. It may or may not have vampires, and that's actually not me just talking shit. Literally, I think there are vampires and werewolves in the trailer. This and may- it may or may not have food. Yes. This may or may not be a Limbo-esque art style game. I mean, what the fuck? You know nothing from this trailer. I know that I'm going to buy it. You know That's all I know. Gonna buy it before I know that I'm going to look into it. <laughs> Definitely going to look into it. Um, what but, if it's like a, a super hardcore chef game? Oh my god, Overcooked Dark Souls style? It's, it's like Overcooked, but everything in the kitchen is insanely dangerous. If you make one little mistake, you're dead. You oh. undercook the chicken and you die of salmonella? I would play yeah, the immediately. shit out of that. It absorbs through your hands. Yes. Oh. You actually, <laughs> if you, you have to pulse the chopping, otherwise you cut your hand off and you're cutting products. <laughs> you, you don't actually have a stove, you just have the back of a jet engine. Oh, <laughs> You actually have to, um, or not like a jet engine, but boiling water to wash the dishes. So if you're not careful, yeah. you end up like, <laughs> like your skin gets melted off. Oh my god, we need to make this game. This game sounds dreadful. Oversouls. No, it sounds terrible. It sounds ter- oversouls. Oversouls. <laughs> no, that sounds bad. But I'll, I'll be, cool. I'll be, uh, I'm, I'll be happy to see what this new game is. I'm interested to see it. Um, they've definitely proven that they can be trusted. With uh, yeah. four installments, or I should say installments, and honestly, it's five, or yeah, Demon Souls. Um, but they've proven themselves. They, we mm-hmm. should expect a solid game. See, hopefully, it's not Dark Souls. Hopefully, they allow themselves to change the genre a little bit more, kind of like what Neo did with it, and kind of like what they did with um, Bloodborne. Bloodborne, where you know this genre, you are the fucking fathers of this genre. Have mm-hmm. fun with it. Don't just keep doing what the Dark Souls has been doing. And well, Bloodborne kind of did though, didn't it? Wasn't wasn't Bloodborne almost? I don't want to say re skin Dark Souls because I think that uh, that generalizes it too much. And I'm sure there are some, you know, mechanical, you know, strategy differences or whatever. But it was very, very much. Uh, it looked from everything I've seen very similar to Dark Souls. Similar type of gameplay, similar difficulty. A lot of the items are similar. It just had a very different uh, kind of style. Uh, kind like of artistically a different of. world so, it, so it wasn't the same world dark souls is very slow plotting combat you sit you mm-hmm. wait you're you're always on the defense and then mm-hmm. you take your very slim margin of opportunity and you use that to strike bloodborne mm-hmm. you don't have a shield nothing is defensive in bloodborne you take a hit and your health bar will change to a different color from a certain extent and that's the health you will lose unless you gain it back by beating the shit out of whoever just hit you. So you are okay. incentivized to keep, to keep attacking. It's way faster than Dark Souls. Uh, and then it's set in the Victorian England Cthulhu-esque oh the setting, era. The setting is so oh good. I, I want to play that game so bad, but I can't because I don't have a PS4. I was, I was, I was watching so, more oh, videos. You should it's get a, amazing. Yeah. You should get a PS4, and you should get Horizon Zero Dawn. And then once you finish that, then go for Bloodborne. 
And yeah. uh, Dark Soul Invader Maybe. Has, <laughs> has corrected me. There is a shield in Bloodborne, uh, but it's bad. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, also, uh, some fun news. I thought this is funny. Uh, for the 50 of you out there that have the Switch, um, the Switch has a handheld mode. And it's notorious for having a short battery life. If you're playing Zelda, it lasts two and a half hours. Other games, you'll probably get about four. Um, Nintendo on Wednesday had what they're calling Nintendo Direct, which is them a release conference, just kind of getting some news out there before E3. Mm-hmm. Um, so keep in mind, the Switch, three-hour battery life, I'll say. The controllers, a 20-hour battery life. So you see a discrepancy there. So of these things, what do you think you should be focusing on for battery? Probably putting more batteries into the, the big magnifying glass that fits over your switch. But yeah, I mean, come on. You want, you want to bat, beep, uh, beef up the switch. <laughs> beep, yeah. beep, 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 beep. So uh, they announced that, A, they're going to start releasing yellow Joy-Cons. Kind of cool. I like the idea of them introducing different colors. Yeah. B, they're introducing a battery extender for the Joy-Cons. Oh, Thank God. Yeah. If your 20 hour battery life isn't enough for your Joy-Con, you can get an extender. I don't know how long it extends it, and it doesn't fucking matter. This (laughs) is an example of Nintendo kind of being out of touch with what the fuck their product is. Hold on. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold the phone here. Are you suggesting that Nintendo may be out of touch with reality? Yes. They may have just said, whoops, (laughs) they went to gravity. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, I, I did that. But no, they um, <laughs> no. <laughs> they have completely lost it on that. It's really, really fucking weird. But something else cool out of the Nintendo Direct, though, they've announced that Payday 2 is going to come to the Switch. Now, it's an old game, so it's not impressive that it's running on the Switch. But stylistically, mm-hmm. this is something... This seems like an odd game. Yes, for the Switch. Yeah. it's not something you're used to seeing on the Nintendo platform. This is a very nitty gritty. You're a fucking thief, killing people and stealing shit. Yeah, Payday Two was so great back in the day, and then it just got bogged down with microtransactions and utterly ruined the game. Uh, yeah. Whereupon the community we, just walked away after that. But there we was, played a lot of that. We played a whole lot of that. It was fun too. I hope a lot that of fun. Nintendo does the standard Nintendo thing of putting the kibosh on a lot of shitty developer practices. On one hand, they put the kibosh on literally everything that doesn't adhere to their family-friendly, puritanical stance most of the time. (laughs) There have been exceptions. Uh, Uh But on the other hand, they prevent publishers and developers from doing pretty shitty things with their games, which is kind of nice and kind of shitty for the developers, but here's to hoping it turns out well. And um, something else they announced outside of that... They are bringing Monopoly, which I am excited about. Oh, shit. This is going to be great. This is amazing. For the Switch. seller right here. Move over, Zelda. We've got fucking Monopoly. No, but on all honesty, I like Monopoly and something like this. It's mobile. You're in an airplane. Kill some fucking time. So, so now, instead, yeah. of it, instead of you ruining all of your family relationships at Christmas with everyone by playing a game of Monopoly, you can do it on the go anywhere you're at all the time. Yes. You okay. can <laughs> spend seven hours playing a game with grandma stealing 20s out of the bank. The entire yep. airline or air flight. Okay, great. Nice. That sounds wonderful. I am all for this. Um, they also. I think, in, oh, what? I think the number of times I've played Monopoly is, I think, about 0.2% of those games were actually finished. Yeah, no yeah. one ever finishes it. <laughs> Just like Risk. Yeah, and uh, Dobby points out um, there was some history with me and Monopoly where we used to play it a lot on the Xbox 360. It sounds really weird, but we played a lot of mm. Monopoly because it plays huh. faster on a console. You don't have to dish out shit and blah blah Everything just sets up. Well, Monopoly still Monopoly, and I'm still kind of narcoleptic, so I would fall asleep <laughs> between my turns, and my controller would vibrate when it was my turn, and I would wake up, make my turn, <laughs> and fall back asleep. <laughs> now, now, the bad thing about board games electronic is the fact that Flipping a console, and you could flip the Switch pretty easily, but flipping a console mm-hmm. is 
not as satisfying as flipping over a board full of pieces. And that's no. why Tabletop Simulator is for you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I will totally buy this on early access. There is a table flip button there. in that game, isn't there? Or yes. Yes, there is. And then, like, you can actually reset it to before flip so it doesn't actually ruin your game. So, yeah. Oh, that just ruins it. It to be like a roguelike <laughs> tabletop simulator. Oh, God. No take backs. <laughs> so, oh, God. so, Nintendo well. also had some other news, uh, much to the dismay of many. Uh, the Nintendo Classic. No one knew this, but supposedly this was not a long term project to them. This was designed to be a limited release. And this month will be the last month that they ship supplies to retailers this year, is how they worded it. Hmm. Here's, here's what actually happened. So that's, that's, the corporate, <laughs> that's the corporate speak for, holy oh, shit, guys, the Switch actually sold. We don't have to turn into Atari now. Uh, by the way, Virtual <laughs> Console will launch later this year, so we're killing the only thing that can possibly compete with it legally. Uh, fuck you, <laughs> buy a Switch. Yeah. And I think it's also because I really expect at E3 they are going to announce Virtual Console and get that Mm -hmm. rolling. Absolutely. This is is just a way for them to push $5 fucking NES games. That is literally the only reason why they're doing this. It's not out of character for Nintendo at all. Uh, who seems to be out of touch with reality, as we've established prior in this in this uh, podcast, um, to say, "Wow, that thing that was selling like gangbusters that no one could keep on shelves, we should probably stop selling that." That sounds great. We actually hate money. Yeah, it's really weird, especially given the financial crisis they were in before the switch came out. Because contrary yeah. to everyone's all that we printed money. <laughs> They had lost Mm -hmm. half of their free cash revenues from the release of the Wii U right before the launch of the Switch. Yeah. So So when when did the NES Classic actually come out? It hasn't wasn't that long ago, was it? And they're already stopping. I will get you a date because we have this worldwide connected network of computers and mobile devices. Well, while he's looking up the date, I believe it was October. But regardless, it's a short run. It's a really yeah, short run. Not only a short run, but the beginning of the release, they were already out anyway. Yeah. So it's a short run coupled with the fact that you it's couldn't Nintendo. find them anywhere during that short run. Retail availability, November to April 2017. Retail availability, non-existent because Nintendo does not understand yeah. the basics of supply God. and demand. But that's ever. not exactly news, right? Yeah. <laughs> we knew that would happen. It's Nintendo. But yeah, I'm surprised, I'm surprised they canceled it so early. I would have expected a longer... A longer lifetime for that. I am surprised, but the way they worded it, I would not be surprised to see them release a new one next year, different games, and here's another one. Come get it, and then we'll have an artificial inflation of the market for third-party sellers. I hope not. I hope they don't do that, especially not with different games and stuff. Well, it's not... They're not intentionally creating a elevated price for third-party. It's just what happens because Nintendo doesn't know how to fucking supply things. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And they've always had that problem. Always. But, I mean, let's be honest. They're underproducing, but it makes people want it. There's always demand. Mm. Right. So, I mean, we critique them, but they're doing something right. I, I Not guess. exactly a small company losing a bunch of money. So any any you know first year econ student can tell you that the supply curve and the demand curve. It's really great to hit that point right on the X where we are. You are manufacturing exactly as many as people want to buy because turns out that makes you a lot of fucking money and it loses you a very little bit of fucking money. And, you know, if Nintendo would come to my college and take an econ course, they could learn that, too. So, Nintendo, I'm looking at you, and I'm inviting you to Econ 101. (laughs) Yeah, they will never learn. Never learn. So, we also had a little bit more to go with on news. Um, The Switch has been selling pretty well. It has sold uh, how many units was that, Tom? Uh, let me let me get the number because I I actually closed my thing because I'm a bad podcast host because <laughs> because reasons. Uh, the Switch has sold nine hundred and six thousand units. So that's impressive. This console's been out a little over a month. 
with mm-hmm. supply issues. So, I mean, they're selling them as soon as they get them out there. 900, 906,000 is pretty solid. Yeah. So, Tom, how many Legend of Zeldas have been sold for the Switch? Not Wii U, for the Switch. Specifically, the Switch version of Breath of the Wild sold 925,000 units. <laughs> So more more people <laughs> bought the, the Switch version of The Legend of Zelda than people who bought the Switch. Yes. How does that even work? The ways I could imagine it working are, you know, some people bought a collector's and normal edition for, you know, the actual collectors who want to keep a boxed copy sealed somewhere on a shelf. Totally get that. I've done it too. The other way I can think of it is someone like me who doesn't have a Switch, but they know they really want Zelda, so they go ahead and they buy the game before they can obtain the console. And so you can look at it longingly while tears stream down your face. <laughs> um, but uh, it, the um, Ars Technic article also says that in some cases, retail estimated sales numbers can vary a little bit. They're inaccurate. So it could be that it's a one-to-one ratio. But as the numbers are being reported right now, we have more copies of Zelda Switch out there than we do actual Switches to play it on. Okay, so here's where I'm going to stop you, Tom. I'm supposed to be the nuanced one. I'm not being nuanced on this. How the fuck do you sell more copies of a game than you do a goddamn console? (laughs) Because it's Zelda. No no fucking game has a one-to-one attachment rate. That does not fucking happen. I, it does when you build the game into the system. It does with Wii Sports. Okay, okay. It does. Pack-ins. It also We're, does. Fuck packins. Packins don't count. Okay, all right. No game uh, has one to one attachment. I do, I need to look up like a Super or Mario sixty four with something like an eighty percent attachment rate. Here we go. Here's attachment rate. I'm looking up the best attachment rates right now, uh, and and talking and blowing time while I'm doing it. I don't have it. Uh, great. Yeah, fuck, this is shit. fuck it. I'm just so, I, either way. It doesn't matter. Yeah, one to one silly. attachment rates do not happen. This is insane. Nintendo has hit it out of the fucking park. <laughs> is what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah, this is absolutely ridiculous. So fuck that noise. Fuck Nintendo. We critique them. They once again tell us to shut up. They know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. I think they just got extremely lucky. No. Okay, on no, game no, 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 development, you... they absolutely know what they're doing. On everything else, literally everything else, they are stumbling through the woods blind. You want to know that how they know what they're, or how we should know they got on top of their game? Dragon Quest X is about to release in Japan. This game is not Nintendo exclusive. It is coming out for PS4. It's coming out, I believe, for the Switch. It's coming out for the 3DS and I think the Vita. Dragon Quest X Collector's Edition Bundle for PS4. It comes with the PS4 game, some cool shit, and the Nintendo 3DS version. Let me repeat that. The PS4 Collector's Edition Dragon Quest X comes with the game for the PS4 and the Nintendo 3DS. So... Nintendo is packed in with the goddamn Sony bundle. (laughs) This is weird. Yeah, you don't say. This is weird. (laughs) This is really weird. weird. Uh, What's the bleed over? If you're buying, if you are a PS4 owner and you're buying Dragon Quest, what are the chances that you also have a 3DS? What are the chances that you actually want that game? Now, here's the big thing. I don't know. The thing to remember is... (laughs) This, what the Switch is going for with this home console on the go, Sony's already done. It's called the fucking Vita. They have a handheld. Why are they packing in a goddamn Nintendo handheld? I I don't know. I have no reason. I have literally nothing to say. I don't want to say I'm against it. So so it's kind of cool to see. What do I do as the Dragon Quest fan who has absolute disdain for Nintendo? Can I sell this game at GameStop? I imagine they're going to be absolutely flooded with copies Hmm. of this game because not everyone's going to want a 3DS version of the game you already have on the PS4. And here's where the fun caveat is. You're going to see both these games or the the 3DS one's going to be marked not for resale or something like that. Oh, I'm sure. But does that ever stop anyone? No, no, no. Me to you. Me to you Craigslist all over the place. But uh, they will not go to GameStop and any actual LLC will not do it. GameStop actually pays attention to that because back back in my day, I bought my copy of Sonic 2, which was someone else's pack-in that had not for resale stamped on the front of it. And I took that up to the (laughs) 
the counter and I bought that shit for however much. Yeah, but you're also nice. talking back in 1995. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's still, you. I need to look at the law on that because I don't know. Actually, no, I, I do know. I do know. There's absolutely no legal way to prevent that. Um, being able to sell as a business or as a person, you could piss off the company, but they legally cannot do anything to you. GameStop's hmm. not going to piss off the company because GameStop's already closed 200 stores nationwide. Yeah, GameStop won't piss off the company because they're afraid of Nintendo coming back on them or, or the developers coming back on them and saying, fuck you, we're not sending you any more copies of whatever. <laughs> but that would be suicide for a developer, too, because people... I guess still go to GameStop to buy games. Not that much. Yeah, they why? just they just closed. Why would you do that? They're yeah. closing two hundred <laughs> stores nationwide. Good. Uh, yeah. Why would anybody do that? They deserve it. But it's just I thought that was a really interesting, weird. Yeah. And that's, also, that's, Dragon right. Quest is a JRPG. I mean, it is a fucking long ass JRPG. Why the fuck do you want two different copies of the game? It's not like yeah. those saves go back and forth. You're not going to put 200 hours on the PS4, then 150 hours on your goddamn 3DS. This, I mean, you might, but who the fuck's doing that? This is why I really want a Switch. It's because the promise of I can put 200 hours into Breath of the Wild, and then I can take it on a plane and put another four hours into Breath of the Wild on the same goddamn save file. Sony has that. It's called the fucking Vita. No one has them. There's yeah, like but nobody four has people it. Yeah. I know all that have a Vita. And that's what I'm saying. It's an <laughs> indictment on Sony. Sony had the idea first. They yeah. did. They botched the so, shit out of it, and now they're so, selling Nintendo fucking handheld games. Yep. So here's something I'm, I'm curious about. Have, have either of you played a Vita? Yes, actually. So, yes. My, my, so uh, is it actually a nice device? Like, it, did it oh, just not catch on? It's fucking is it, Was it a great idea? It, was it, it perfect? It just didn't catch on or what? What follows, was the problem? It follows the trend of literally every handheld that has ever tried to compete with Nintendo, with the exception mm -hmm. of Sega's handheld. Um, mm -hmm. Handhelds, I should say. Everything that has tried to compete with a Nintendo handheld in their own fucking dojo um, has gotten the floor bite by Nintendo, but the devices that went into battle were all so much better. Technically, they were they were more beautiful, they were more powerful, they had better battery mm -hmm. life. Uh, with okay, the huge exception to this is the fucking Game Gear. Oh, I thought he was gonna say Nomad. I was gonna say Nomad shouldn't count. Uh, right, right. I had, Nomad I had should Nomad. absolutely I not count. Um, <laughs> but the Vita and and the PSP are beautiful systems. They're metal and glass. They feel not not like dragging down heavy, but like solid mm. and expensive. I'm not going to break this. This isn't a toy kind of heavy. It feels like a mm -hmm. piece of consumer electronics, unless like a toy. Uh, the screen yeah. is gorgeous. Oh my god, Sony knows how to make a fucking display. Uh, the games were beautiful. They ran great. I love the Vita as a device. The only issue is it's a handheld that's not got the Nintendo sticker on it. Uh, it yeah. absolutely has like 20 games and that's it. And what you can realistically collect the Vita library today. Um, yeah, it, it just, it cannot compete with software and that's where Nintendo shines. And Fun fact, the binding of Isaac is actually, is actually on Vita too. Yes. Uh, the Vita was actually starting to become an indie machine. Yeah. Is essentially yeah. what it was relegated to, which honestly would be, for me, the perfect use of something like that, like a handheld game, indie games, a lot of those are perfect for that. Then oh, get a Switch. Great. Yeah. Nintendo is making a huge push for indie devs. I huge really, push. I, I'm going to buy Binding of Isaac on the Switch. So, Adam, I got a question for you. Yeah, sure. The Binding of Isaac, the newest update, do they give uh -huh. you the stats on the side of the screen? Yeah. Yeah, there's actually stats like it'll show your attack value, your number, okay, your numerical I'll, value. I was making sure because I know on the Switch it has it, so I didn't know if they yeah. put a little bonus to it. Yeah, you can toggle it off and on with one of the buttons. I don't remember which one. All right. But yeah, so that's all I had on that. That is strange news of the day. Sony <laughs> has officially said, fuck the Vita, we're done. Nintendo, you win. So, Adam, you were telling us about something oh. earlier. One of one of yeah. your favorite games, the sequel. It's got some oh, news. Yeah. yeah, so The Last of Us 2, um, it was basically just a Twitter update from one of the voice actors. They posted a picture in their motion capture suits that they were, they're filming the, you know, the motion capture and the voice for The Last of Us 2. And that's huge, because that game is yeah, awesome. I am, oh my god, I'm so excited for that. 
I'm so excited for that. The trailer was excellent. It, it raised so many questions. Is Joel alive or dead? Yeah. That's oh, a big play, one to I want to play it. I want to play it so much. It was The Last of Us is one of my favorite games of all time, for sure. Absolutely. So, as of like as an adult gamer, there's been two mm-hmm. games where the story has driven me to play it. Like just <laughs> keep going. It's The Last of Us and it's Horizon Zero Dawn. One nice. of them I expected to be an epic story with The Last of Us and it did not disappoint, which is weird. Most of the time when you have a game that is sold on that much of how awesome the story is going to be, it normally doesn't deliver. Though I'm mm-hmm. not going to overlook That game was also heavily sold on the incredible intelligence of the AI. That was not quite what they promised. Ellie, when AI was controlling her, was not quite as smart as they made it seem like she was going to be in the initial trailer. It it was good. Yeah, but she never got in the way. She didn't get in the way, so it wasn't bad. They did a great job with that. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, yes, this game was beautiful. The story was great. It did everything on that. It promised. It did end up short on the AI that it promised. I feel like I'm out of the club on this one because I, I liked The Last of Us. I thought it was a very, very good game. It was not my favorite game. I thought, I thought the story was, was good. I thought the, I mean, the, the graphics were incredible, outstanding. I can't say enough good mm-hmm. about that. That I mm-hmm. couldn't believe I was playing this on a fucking PS3. It's Naughty Dog. Yeah. Naughty Dog is. Oh, yeah. If Naughty Dog makes it, you know it's going to be gorgeous. They, they are masters yep. of their craft. Um, but, you know, I, I thought the, the gameplay was, was good. Uh, the story was good. I didn't see anything overly outstanding about it. It was solid. Mm-hmm. It was complete. Uh, it, it didn't have the brown color palette. Uh, it, I don't know. Uh, it just it didn't blow me away like I was expecting it was from all the hype I had heard. It might have been that we hyped it too much for you because we love it so much. <laughs> it, it could have been. It could have been. As well as part of my uh, love for the game actually was kind of niche and was part of the online play. Oh, Which okay. had a really fun yeah, meta game people, with it. I didn't even touch I nev- the online. I, never, I didn't touch online. It and is, I played through the game, I think, twice or almost twice. If, the one thing that, that The Last of Us did that all games need to do, because in, in movies, um, you know, they, they have to grab you very quickly to get you invested Mm -hmm. in what they're trying to i don't want to say sell you but where they're trying to get you to go in the movie uh the Mm -hmm. last of us the first segment of gameplay which you can absolutely watch online fucking hooks you and you don't even have to play it like you can just watch that moment online you're like holy fuck i have to play this game what the shit this is so fucked up it's (laughs) kind of metroidvania-ish in the way that it, and stick with me here because it's really weird where I'm going with this. Yeah, it's, not, it's, not that they, <laughs> it's not that they give you all these powers and strip it away. It's that they show you this normal world and then the next thing you know, it's all gone. It's, it's got the inciting mm-hmm. incident. Yeah. It, it, does, it does the perfect yeah. story thing of, okay, here's something mundane, inciting incident, now you give a shit. And it's, it, it's, yeah. and it's not in the context that, of next day, it is all of a sudden, yeah. it's not, oh, this looks like the world, just yeah. people are going crazy. It was like, no, mm-hmm. shit is gone. This yeah. is 20 years, 30 years, I don't remember how many years down the line. I, I, wish I think they, it's only like a couple, but. I like the world building that they did do, and I realized they left it open because it's, this is a franchise. It's not a one and done game. But I wish mm-hmm. they would have done more world building in the game. Uh, there's a lot you can see. There's a lot you can read about. But it seemed like, you know, the... I don't want to get into too many spoilers, but the first part of the game and you're with some people and I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is interesting. I'm going to learn about how people are living. And then all that gets brushed aside and you're alone. You're like, OK, I guess I don't get to learn about any of that. Sony? Yeah could i mean they had the ability to do this they could spin off a side game in the universe of the last of us that would be sim city-esque yeah uh colony um simulation kind of thing where you have to get people to do things build things resource management it could be really fun but they'll never do it it would just be really interesting no, yeah that'd be I, I don't think Naughty Dog would want them to, I wouldn't, I, I don't want to say sully the franchise, but take the chance yeah. that someone else could yeah. sully the franchise. Well, yes. and here's something you have to realize. The big reason I liked the multiplayer, that was an aspect of the multiplayer. It oh, was really? colony, um, it was a colony metagame to it. Okay. Where you huh. were getting medicine for sick people 
And if you kept losing, you kept losing resources, people would get sick, your population would start oh. to die. As you won, you would be bringing in more medicine to heal your sick. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. I didn't yeah. know there was that much meta game like outside of the actual gameplay part of it. Yeah, and that, that's what I'm saying. Like they had kind of a colony builder management thing there that was super hands off, but mm-hmm. they put the very loose framework to it. I think mm-hmm. that's something that could be stripped off in its own, or possibly made a side game bonus DLC. Hey, look, here's a little goofy arcade game we made. It's it's nice inside I, of the game. That is, I really wish more games. This is is kind of tangentially related. I wish more games would say we don't need multiplayer. I, I wish more games were were that yeah. brave to say, oh well, I mean, how many how many players do your servers hold? And they go, servers. <laughs> no, dude, you, you just put Not the disc in, you just fucking play it, and you, you're done. Maybe there's New Game Plus. Maybe. I'm, Maybe, if you're lucky. I love New Game Plus. But yeah. I, I don't have anything against multiplayer, but I like the fact that some devs don't put it first. Like, okay, the Gears of War series is known for being multiplayer as well as single player. That mm-hmm. game, Gears 4, had a good story. It was a fun campaign and it has good multiplayer, but they both go very well hand in hand where it helps the game live longer for me, such as something like Doom. I'll play the campaign. I'm not going to touch the fucking multiplayer. Well, that's right. If it had a better multiplayer, it would help the game. I I think it it absolutely would. And I think multiplayer was really in Doom 2016 because it has the, the name Doom. That's the only mm-hmm. reason it was there. But the fact that the Probably. multiplayer was so shitty absolutely drags down the entire experience for me. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a section of the game that I don't go into because I know it's going to be trash. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think the fact that it's there waters down the experience. Um, and and hmm. if they didn't include it at all, I can see people rioting in the streets because a Doom game came out that didn't have multiplayer. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's, let's be real. The multiplayer you got probably wasn't one you wanted anyway but i'm true i don't feel that developers are beholden to do multiplayer because i mean oh well, I, I gotta tread lightly on this look at bioshock first one no right. multiplayer yes people loved it yep second Excellent one they're game. like we're gonna add multiplayer and everyone's like what the fuck did you do this is yep. terrible get it the fuck out yep so i mean but at it, least it was an option it's not I, like... I don't even I don't want options if they're bad options, right? Right? You can you can go into a Chinese restaurant and they're like, okay, broccoli chicken, sweet and sour, plate of dog shit. Like, Whoa, hold on a minute. What did you even <laughs> offer it? But right? at the same time, though, I don't just because a game's a great single player game. I don't want it to be well. It's a great single player game. Fuck multiplayer. Like The Last of Us was a great single player game. Its multiplayer was fun. It's multiplayer no one cared about, but it was fun. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the focus, but at least when you do go to check it out, it's a good experience. It's I'm, fun. I'm exactly. okay with options if, if they're good options, but if it's tacked on, I don't yeah. think it should be there. Yeah. And likewise, um, games that are multiplayer games with tacked on crappy campaigns. Titanfall? Like, Not Titanfall 2. Yeah. Titanfall the Call of Duty well, series. Titanfall 1 didn't have a campaign. It was technically part of the multiplayer. Right. Right. Technically, I'm waiting for COD to just say "fuck it, we're not doing a campaign" because oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Supposedly, be this fantastic. last one had a very good campaign. The problem is, no really? one cared. Right. If I I played Call of Duty back in the day exclusively for the campaign because the campaigns were awesome. And also, then, because online shoot or online shooters weren't yeah, the biggest thing. It wasn't the thing, right? Uh, and then somewhere, I think Modern Warfare Two is just like. Okay, this is this is an okay campaign, and I ignored yeah. the multiplayer because I just didn't like COD online, and everything right. else after that was just I guess we'll throw in a campaign. I guess. <laughs> Modern putting... Warfare One had a pretty good campaign. Oh, Modern Warfare oh, One like, was yes. amazing. Yeah, uh, but you know what COD should do today is you know put in your little target zone breaching the building shooting targets thing so people can get used to the controls and the new mechanics uh and that's it that's literally it that's a fun thing that some games are starting to do for the while you download download x amount and then you play yeah people are starting to do that with tutorials so while the game's downloading you can play the tutorial you can do the character builders yeah and then once it's finally ready boom you're you're, you don't have to do the bullshit yeah that's nice so i will not be playing call of duty next week 
Uh, mostly yeah. because I, I don't have the equipment <laughs> to play Call of Duty next week. And because you don't play Call of Duty. And because I don't play Call of Duty. Yeah, uh, what no I'm going to try to play next week is I'm actually going to try to get into Stardew Valley. I'm going to try oh, to play nice. some of that. Uh, if I can get Hyperlight Drifter working on this machine, I'm going to try to play some of that uh, because I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling the itch. I'm getting the withdrawals. I don't have my Dark Souls-esque experience that kicks my ass six ways to Sunday. Uh, so I'm going to make sure that Hyperlight Drifter installs. I'm going to try to go through that. You should um, play um, I, wanted to be, I Want to Be the Man. I want to be the guy? No. Yeah, I want to no. be the guy. You no. want something that's going to kick your ass? No. The, that's, that's the exact opposite of difficult but fair. That's just, fuck you. That's the whole game. It's <laughs> fuck you the game. I will not be playing that. So, so you, you guys gonna going to be playing Battle Dudes? So, yeah, I'll be playing some Battle Man, be playing some Rocket Man. I won't be playing uh, as much. Um, buddies Battlegrounds, in, Rocket League. But he's in uninitiated. town. Yeah, the Battle Man will be Definitely, though. <laughs> as well as has been Heroes. That game's good, quick run. So, uh, nice. so Adam, you, you gonna finish Resident Evil for us? <laughs> yeah, I'll try. Okay. We'll see. I'm I'm so bad about getting into phases of games, like a certain mood of game. You know, I play a game for a while, and then I'll have no interest in playing that game if I play a different game. That kind of thing. Yeah, I'm so, having trouble getting back to Factorio um, because of that. Yeah, I might play some yeah, Dota. I, I have trouble with that. So, but I'm gonna try to play something different, whatever it ends up being, something other than Rocket League and Battleground, something new to talk about, or maybe a game I played a long time ago. Maybe I'll fire up the PS3 or something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I have a cut. I'll, I, will, I will play something else at least for a minute. <laughs> maybe give Majesty a try. I'm telling you, nah, I might. I, I was. It doesn't at sound like that doesn't sound like something I would like that much. But. I'm looking at it on GOG. I don't, oh, I don't know if it oh, runs on, yeah. on Linux. No, nah, it's, it's Windows, but I'm sure I could throw it in, in Wine. Possibly. I could well, totally grab this. <laughs> either way, I think that's all we got for you guys this week. Um, so you can tell us about how terrible our new setup is. Give us some suggestions for the new setup, sound quality, anything you want. You could uh, tweet at us at, at 72 PC Podcast. Um, if you're listening to us live on Twitch, um, you can go to our YouTube 72 PC or 72 pin connector and uh, just check out some of the other videos we got. I'm going to be trying to put up some battle. I got to keep saying battle, man. Battle grounds montages of some weird shit we've been finding because there's definitely some bugs. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. You guys got anything else you want to add? No. No, no, I don't think so. Well, in that case, until next week, game on. See ya, everyone. See ya.